This is Big Podcast. I had a cable, like a one foot cable. It's just long enough that it was a the double rings. It wasn't the single ring. Yeah, TRS. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I think it'll work, but sometimes those don't. Right. And it did. Good. <laughs> We can breathe easy that we are at least connected. It's Build a Big Podcast. I'm David Hooper. This is normally the marketing podcast for podcasters, but what we're talking about here is studios, making yourself sound better. I've got Marcus DePaula. He's a music business friend of mine. He's wired a lot of studios around Music Row and really everywhere because the music business is everywhere, but he's gotten into podcasting. He was a huge inspiration for me redoing what I call the Red Room. It's a five by eight room, five by eight by eight if you want to really get specific. I just did it. This is the first recording that I've done in it. I have probably enough panels for, I would say, a room three or four times this big. We'll talk about that. And on this episode, we're going to talk about what to do regardless of the space that you're in, whether it's a closet or the office that you're in, what to do to make your space sound better. Because Marcus, you work out of a larger room. You also have panels that mine were based on. So we're kind of operating with the same thing, rock wool panels that we built ourselves. That's right. And they work great for you. I hope they're working great for me. We'll find out during the mix. <laughs> sounds good to me, man. Does it? Okay. Yeah, sounds great. Well, I went with the room within a room concept. I was talking to different audio engineers, you included. I said, how would you do this thing if you were just building it out and you could do anything? And somebody said, do a room within a room. That's how most studios are built and explain that concept, what that is. Essentially, that's the best way to isolate yourself from the outside environment. So you're creating not just like sticking stuff up on a wall, but you're actually building another wall that the sound has to penetrate so that it isolates a lot better. So you're basically double walling the environment around you. And that air gap between the two walls is what stops the sound both from coming in and from going out. Like if you're playing drums, you don't want to bug your neighbors. <laughs> so that's a lot of times too. It'll, it'll serve a mutual purpose for both keeping sound in and keeping sound out. So what I had done when I decided to build my studio, the red room, the closet is I just got a bunch of foam because it was cheap. Yeah. I thought it would look cool on video. It looked cool in photos and it's okay. We'll talk about the NRC rating. It's basically taking 60% of the sound, whereas I think what I've built and what you've got is over 100% of the sound that it absorbs. It's 1.05, so it's perfect sound absorption. And what I found, and, and I actually saw you talking about this earlier today, Marcus, that when you get into podcasting, when you know better, you do better. Yeah. I was like, well, it was okay for where I was, but I wanted to step it up. So it's not really a room within a room. I left the old foam that I had, and that is the space in between the panels and drywall. So instead of bringing the panels out via cork or something where there's that air gap, mm -hmm. I've got foam in there, which I'm like, well, it's not perfect, but uh, I wasn't going to remove that foam. I mean, that's a permanent situation when you decide to put foam up. Right. <laughs> it ain't coming off easy. So I was glad that I had this option. I pulled some foam off of a place, my old house, they had it up on the ceiling. The friend of mine that I bought my house from had made the basement a recording studio and he used the spray glue, Super 77 or whatever it's called. And it was not fun yeah. to get off. I ended up just putting new <laughs> drywall right over top because I could not get the little foam bits from ripping the panels off the wall. off. Yeah. Popcorn ceiling has nothing on. Exactly. Foam. Exactly. <laughs> Let's talk about the three different types of spaces that most podcasters would be in. And let's start with a portable setup. That's one of the things that a lot of people find themselves using. If you share a house with somebody else, maybe you don't have the space for even an office, really. Portable setup, what can somebody do to make their space sound better? First of all, what do they need to watch out for in the average household reverberation standing waves. You tell me in, in your audio lingo. I often will record my clients in whatever space they're in. I'll go to them instead of bringing them into my home studio. So when I go into a client space, 
I'm looking for the room that, like you said, has the least amount of reverberation. So that means that it has the least amount of hard, glossy, super slick surfaces. So hardwoods are bad, hardwood floors, brick is bad, glass is bad. Anything that has a lot of that will end up bouncing the sound right back at you. So I look for the rooms that are carpeted. I look for the rooms that have bookshelves and curtains and couches and anything that might either absorb or break up that sound. Even if it is a hardwood room, if you put a rug down, that is passable for me. That's the first step. The second step is making sure that we're like not right next to the air conditioner blower or near a window that's by the highway or a train yard like the Lightning 100 station. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. When it, so the Lightning 100 station, this is where I do my broadcast show. It's an old car factory and it has a flat roof. And when it rains really hard, you yep. can hear it. Yep. It's next to train tracks. So yeah. when a train comes by, one time a train tipped over with a big load of Hyundais. Oh my God. Yeah. We heard it. it shook the building. And sometimes you, you can't get away from stuff, but when you can <laughs> get away from it. Yeah. And they've treated their studios there at Lighting 100 really well. So you don't hear the train. <laughs> yeah. We actually use panels like this. We've had en engineers make panels very similar to what you and I have. Yeah. Yeah. So I can bring some of my panels with me to kind of spread around the room if, if I need to. But a lot of times it's good enough just for me to find that space that's not so echoey and then go into that. I also used to bring a photography backdrop stands where it has the two stands and the bar across the top. And I had some nice blankets that I would like clamp up and it looked kind of ghetto. My panels are a little bit more professional looking than a blanket clamp to some poles. And how would you set that up? You set that up in front of the person or behind them or around them? Or? Ideally, you want to put the panels immediately in front of the person so that they're facing the panels because the majority of the energy of their voice is projecting out of their mouth into them. And what you want to do is you want to hamper it from reflecting anywhere else after it gets out of their mouth. You want the microphone to capture it. And then you want it to stop at that blanket or baffle or curtain or bookshelf and not bounce around the room, which is what caused the reverberation. That's something to think about too, by the way, if you're recording with a huge monitor yes, in front of you. Absolutely. And I see that happen a lot that you're a foot or two away from your computer monitor. And I know I've got a couple of them in here. One of them is a big iMac, probably 24 inches. Yes. Quite large. I think it's made out of glass and it's bumping it right back to me. Yep. And so what I do in that instance, I, I've even consulted with clients that have had condenser microphones that are ultra sensitive. I can hear phasing from their voice bouncing off the computer monitor. So what I've asked them to do is turn 45 degrees. So you're, you're speaking either to the left or to the right of the monitor and, and the angle of the microphone picking up isn't parallel with that computer screen. So that helps with the phasing issues and you don't get those direct reflections that are parallel to the noise coming out of your mouth. Explain phasing. Phasing is where the wave sound wave bounces off of a surface and comes back into the microphone at a time delay. And that time delay couples with the original sound of your voice. And it makes some weird, weird physics go on that is not good for audio. It, it, it basically hurts your sound when, when you have the reflections doubling on top of your voice when you're speaking that close to a monitor. It's harder to hear the phasing like off of a wall that's 20 feet away because the timing is so far off. But when you're that close, when you're a foot away or a foot and a half away from the computer screen, it's so close that you can hear it. If you have ever double recorded yourself, meaning you've done a local recording and yes. maybe you've had a, uh, like we're using clean feed now, clean feed or squad cast and you've synced things up, but not exactly. Yeah. That's, That's phasing. phasing. Exactly. And another way you'll hear it is if you have a USB microphone where, you know, your headphones are plugged into the microphone and you're hearing yourself directly. And then you record in Audacity or whatever DAW is, and you're hearing what's coming out of your software as well, which is slightly time delayed. You get that kind of doubling phasing effect. 
then it's not good. So a huge blanket or something to dampen those harsh reflections. Obviously, get away from the reflections if you can. Big glass. Yep. Hardwood. Anything you would throw a ball at and a ball would come back, the sound is doing something similar. Exactly. That's exactly right. Speaking of the broadcast show, we've been doing everything remotely since COVID hit. And it's really interesting. It has turned every guest that we have into an engineer. (laughs) One of the things we'll do, uh, we will ask them, if possible, to have a laptop so we can move them around. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll call from like a a bathroom or something. Well, this is the only room I can Uh, find where there's nobody here. And and that's the worst place. Yeah. uh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So we'll say, just take it in a closet. You know, I'm working out of a closet right now, which I I think is another good option for podcasters. But even if you've got clothes in it, you mentioned books. And one of the reasons a lot of engineers love books is because you can turn them backwards Yep. and they're diffusers. So the sound will hit it and bounce all sorts of different ways. And and when you've got a bunch of different clothes in your closet, it's absorbing, but also diffusing what's not absorbed because it's, uh, you you think about your closet, most closets, they're a mess, right? But it works well to record in. And most people don't want to turn their books around backwards for acoustics when yeah. you know, you're know you using a space. <laughs> so even if you take the books, and I know it looks nice when they're all perfectly lined up, but if you can stagger them a little bit, that also diffuses it, but you don't have to turn them around. So if you're anal retentive and like have your books all in a row, that's actually bad for acoustics. <laughs> it's kind of cool when you see podcasters that have, uh, I think the one that is pretty common now is the reclaimed wood behind them yes. for video and things. But if you think about it, if you could have a, a tchotchke shelf yep. with all sorts of different plush toys or books at different levels, I mean, that's going to help you in a better way than that hard surface of reclaimed wood. Although reclaimed wood is better than a slick board, I would imagine, because yes. it does have variations. Absolutely. It, reclaimed wood is actually pretty good surface to face when you're in a space. And a lot of the office spaces and stuff that, that I record in these days have it. It's definitely better than drywall. And wood itself is semi-porous with the wood fibers. So it's like a micro diffuser even in a lot of ways compared to a brick wall or something like that. The brick wall itself is a little rough, but it's such a hard surface. The the wood is a little bit softer. And in Blackbird Studios here in Nashville, the main room that's in their D studio, the main tracking room, they actually have wood paneling all on one side as the sound absorber slash diffuser. And it's a special type of wood. I can't remember what type it is. And they chose it specifically for its acoustic qualities and there's no fabric on the wall at all it's just wood but it's like all these little 3d pieces along the wall that looks nice what do you think about people who do like a portable vocal booth with maybe uh i call it pipe and drape Mm -hmm. the uh, pvc pipe and some packing blankets is that a good option for somebody is that going to be better than working out of an office it is. Uh, it's not a very inspiring place to be in <laughs> and to share your ideas from. Right. I watched the behind the scenes footage from Ryan, the last dragon, and they showed how they did all of the voiceover remotely, like what we're doing. They did it via zoom and they shipped everybody, these studio condenser microphones. And then they also would ship them these. They're basically like these easy up tent kits But instead of just like that tent fabric, it's like a packing blanket material with some extra acoustic weighted material in it. It's basically for an on-site voiceover booth, which I guess they use on movie and TV sets when you have to do voiceover work and stuff like that. But they were sending them out to people's homes so that the actors could do their thing in these tents inside their living room or dining room, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think that can work if you're... I guess talking, you don't have to read a script. Right. That complicates things. Certainly, you can't see a guest if you've got your head in a containers, like the anvil containers. That's what we used to call them. Yeah. Like that you used to use when you were on tour. (laughs) Yeah. And they'll put padding in there and throw a mic in. And it it can work. I I do think there's an element of good enough. And I want to talk about that because you have a normal office space that you record out of, but Mm -hmm. you've been able to put these sound panels in it and it sounds amazing so that is certainly possible with the right 
treatment. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to work out of a closet. You're not going to have to have your head in like the mouth of a lion in a really small space that you're going to bump it if you move any type of bit. You can work out of a normal office. So let's talk about how you've done that. Let's say it's a bedroom office, maybe 15 by 15, however big bedrooms are these days. What would you recommend for somebody in that situation, a spare bedroom they want to turn into a studio or just an office that they can also record in? Pick a room that's carpeted for sure or put a rug down. That's the first surface is the floor. But then the walls directly in front of you either turn so you're facing a bookshelf or a window that has heavy curtains on it or get some acoustic panels. Like you were saying earlier, you actually made yours based on the materials that I recommended in a blog post of mine I did recently. And that's what I've done. I've built 12 panels for just a few hundred bucks In my office, I have them kind of spread out around the room, kind of staggered, but I'm in a 20 by 20 room square that's above my garage. So the larger room allows the sound kind of to dissipate before it gets to the wall. If you're in a smaller room, you need to have the panels more concentrated in that area where your voice is going to be reflecting off of. So the closest wall, especially if you're facing a wall, that's the other thing in my office my desk and my wife's desk are facing each other. So I'm speaking into the middle of the room instead of right into the wall that would be, you know, two feet away from me. So it's funny you say that. So I'm speaking into a wall that's probably two and a half feet away from me, but I'm actually speaking into the corner. Ah, Is it better to do that or is it better to speak onto that flat surface that's going to bounce back to you. And also, by the way, my mic is at an angle. Yes. So just to complicate things. No, the angles are always better. Like in the professional recording studios, they actually don't make any parallel walls or any 90 degree angles. So speaking straight into a parallel surface with your face is the worst thing you could do. So what you're doing in the corner is great, but you also have those nice panels that you just built that are doing their job because I cannot hear any reflections at all when I'm listening to right now. <laughs> well, that's great. Cause I was really nervous. I sent Marcus when I was building these panels, say, Hey, it's panel day. And I installed him and it was a lot of work. It was probably, it was me, my father-in-law, who's an engineer. Mm-hmm. I'll share these plans on the website because they are crazy. Yeah. And then my wife, who is also an engineer, uh, just happens to be, and uh, you can imagine how efficient that process was. (laughs) It took us probably all in all 35 hours to do all this, three people working over three days. Yeah. And um, I got them up and I said, man, I hope these work. They work. They work great. Y'all did an awesome job. You've got to look at the room. I talked to several different people and that's why I wanted to have you on here to talk about it. It doesn't have to be perfect. There are these little things that you can do. Let's talk about the coverage of your room. You said it was 20 by 20, you said? Yes. A fairly big room. Yep. That's like 400 square feet. Yep. And you had one pack of rock wool that you put frames around. Is that enough to go around and give coverage to the whole room? Basically, yeah. On one side, onto the left of me here is a window And we have covered two thirds of that wall between two bookcases with the heaviest blackout curtains I could find. (laughs) And I actually have plans to build a wood diffuser, like barn door type thing that looks a little cooler because it's my currently my backdrop for my video training sessions. And it's not the prettiest thing to see wrinkly curtains behind me. It's also hard if they're dark, they don't really pick up well on video. Exactly, exactly. You can't see the shape of them as much. Yeah. So I've got this plan for doing this wood panel that's going to be a diffuser made out of triangles that looks cool because my logo is a play button. So kind of playing off of my logo there for branding. Besides the curtains to the left of me, I did mount one panel above my desk and the ceiling and one panel above my wife's desk on the ceiling. You'll see in recording studios and I actually had somebody say, you're actually missing the point of the ceiling panels. You don't mount them to the ceiling. You have to stand them off six inches or whatever. I'm like, yeah. yes, that is correct for when you're mixing or you're you're playing music with a guitar amp or bass amp that's full frequency. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just talking into a microphone just with my human voice. My voice is low, but it does not go super, super low. And the reason for standing off the ceilings is it captures the lower frequencies, which are the longer waveforms. It needs more space to bounce off and and capture it on the reflection back. So I just mounted mine right to the ceilings. All I'm worried about is is 
eliminating any reflections from getting back into my microphone. So this is not made for a mix room that you'll see a lot of people do for their home studio for music. Is that important for the average podcaster to think about? They call them clouds, by the way, cloud tiles. I would add those last because A, they're really hard to install. (laughs) Yeah, so I hear. (laughs) Yeah, and B, they do kind of bring the room in on you and make you feel a little claustrophobic, especially if you get the ones that stand off the ceiling. That's the other reason I I mounted mine flush with the ceiling is because I don't want to feel like I'm in a smaller space than I'm actually in. And you might see these in like a hotel, something with a huge right classroom cavernous space yep. that bounces around cafeterias and that kind of thing. And usually I would say six inches, but some of them have got to be a foot or more yeah. off the ceiling. Especially in the really large rooms. And my ceiling right now that I'm under is eight feet. So if I take something, these panels that we built, I don't know, four inches thick. Yeah. So that right there is four inches off of it. And you add another four inches. That's uh that's close to a foot right. of your eight inch and and I'm six, three, so I don't have a whole lot of space in here. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. I want to find the balance between comfort and function. The design has to do the job as far as eliminating enough of the audio. That's the thing. I don't, I don't need it to be absolutely a hundred percent picking up every single sound wave past my microphone. I just need it enough so that it doesn't cause that echoey reverbery sound into my microphone which i'm using a dynamic microphone that's the other thing is i do have a condenser microphone here too but um i choose to use my dynamic microphone when i'm doing my podcast because it picks up less of that excess noise that i haven't covered for because i don't have wall-to-wall soft fabric panels like you do in your space yeah and and if i had a bigger space I, i wouldn't be doing this it already kind of looks like one of those uh, padded rooms that right. you might put somebody in. <laughs> <The> straight jacket. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's something to think about. You know, it's funny. I, I put broadcloth. That's what these things are wrapped in. Cool. It's interesting going to a fabric store in Nashville. And Jeff Sanders from 5 AM Miracle told me the same thing. You walk into any fabric store in Nashville and you say sound panels. And they're like, yep, gotcha. Right. <laughs> like they build these things in this town so much. That yeah. She's like, I got exactly what you need. And she showed me black at first. My wife was with me. She's like, man, that's going to be a dark room. Really dark, yeah. That's the thing about it is you don't have, there's no windows in my space. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you. I mean, there's an element of comfort that you want. There's an element of nice lighting that you want. You are going to be spending a lot of time in here. So I feel like what you have done always sounds great. Obviously, you're doing a lot of post-production and things. So yeah. if there were problems, you would take them out. But you know how to use the mic. That's part of it. You've got the compressors. You've got probably a, a noise gate or something on it that's cutting any kind of noise that's not of a certain volume. Right. Then you've got your space around you. So I, I think when you've got just a little bit of each of these things, it's going to make your podcast sound so much better than the average podcast. And it doesn't cost a lot. These panels that I built, I haven't added it all up, but I don't know. I mean, what would you say you have invested in yours? I mean, you could do it for under 500 bucks, right? Yeah. The initial build that I did, I think was just barely under $300, but I got like the cheapest felt fabric I could find. And I've actually bought new, nicer fabric to upgrade those felt panels, but I haven't had time to rip them apart and then staple on the new fabric yet. (laughs) Well, the fabric to me was the most expensive part. I actually had some special acoustic fabric. It was coming in from China though. Mm. Right now they're delays. So this thing was like three weeks late. It came in. I I couldn't wait anymore. Right. I was somewhat disappointed in it because like, oh man, you know, but I I was on a schedule and I had to get my people when I could get them. Um, Right, right. I I think that says something though. A lot of people want to go for like Automute, which I've got some Automute stuff, which is a brand of, it's compressed something. They say it's made out of, recycled material and it's pretty good sound absorption. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can spend a lot. Rock wool is basically insulation that you put in between the studs of your house right? to keep you from hearing your toilet flush or maybe your neighbors if you're in a horizontal property regime or an apartment. Yeah. But it's super cheap. I mean, a box of that for all the panels that I had was like 55 bucks. The wood is going to be some money. Screws. The big issue is going to be labor, which Marcus is a woodworker and knows what he's doing. I am not. So maybe you've got a friend and 
you got to be good at measuring and just be willing to put in the time. But I would say that if I had to buy Automute panels, eh, I don't know, probably 1500 bucks for what I want here. Exactly. That's, that's exactly uh, what I was going to say. It, I mean, it, adds it, up it wasn't the money for me. I mean, really a lot of it for me was connection to this studio and it, it means something that people believe in me. Mm-hmm. And I had a father-in-law who believed in me and a wife who believed in me. I was like, all right, I'm going to use that as inspiration to do better work. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's something that speaks to you. You can certainly buy it out for not a whole lot of money. And, and I think even at 1500 bucks, the payoff is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I do hear people talk about investing in acoustic treatment before you invest in a good microphone. And that is definitely true for voice actors who end up could spend, you know, $3,600 on a Neumann U87. Right. You know, if you're if you're using a $3,600 microphone in an untreated room that sounds like garbage, you, it doesn't matter how expensive a microphone is if your acoustics are bad. So I understand that sentiment. But for podcasters, you can get a dynamic microphone like my SM7B here and get away with a lot less acoustic treatment. So you don't have to blow your bank on, you know, doing this big construction project and outfitting yeah. your house with a, a for- formal vocal booth. If you just spend $400 on a decent microphone, then you can spend 500 bucks on acoustic treatment instead of $5,000 on acoustic treatment. <laughs> yeah. A g- good mic helps. It doesn't have to even be a great mic. I mean, it's, it's great for what you need. My mic, uh, 350, I think is a retail, the AT BP 40. Right. Uh, the, the sure mic that you're using, which is one of the two most popular radio mics is what you say, 500, the RE 20 mm-hmm. by electro voice is about 500. So it's a good investment. If you're serious about podcasting equipment that I've got here, I've got a, a computer that Dell gave me. I've got nice. a processor that's about 250. I've got a box that converts everything to the computer that's, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks. I mean, I've got maybe a thousand dollars wrapped up in it, plus the panels. It It's not going to break the bank for you to have this professional sound. And, and we've talked about it, Marcus, that you are judged on the quality of your audio mm-hmm. as well as the words. Yep. And you think about that, it's disappointing to me. I know that I've got a lot of interviews that I do with people and they are great, mm-hmm. but they come through on like a speakerphone at Starbucks. It sounds like they're at the drive through window <laughs> and immediately people turn off what they're saying and disregard it. And it's really too bad. This is one of the things you can do if you want to have more listeners to give them a, a nicer experience and you're going to record it anyway. So you might as well record it right. Yeah. Even for people who aren't consciously aware of good versus bad audio, there actually is a scientific study that our brain has harder time absorbing the information and accepting it as true if the audio quality is bad. You did a workshop that is still available on your site, if I'm not mistaken, which is Me Only Louder, Mm -hmm. by the way. It's a great site with great audio tips where you really go deep into reflections and phasing and everything that we're talking about here. You've got some cool visuals of the studios that you built, as well as other studios that you've worked in here in Nashville to do music, as well as podcasting. Talk about that a bit, because I think for anybody who really wants to dive deeper into this, it's not about the money. It's about figuring out a plan for what your needs are and understanding what you're getting into. Everybody can throw money at this, but you don't want to get set up like I did previously with this foam. And it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't sound bad. Yeah. But you want something that you can work into, especially if you're a serious podcaster. You want something you can be proud of. Absolutely. There is so much advice out there on how to record room acoustics, how to mix, how to EQ and compress and all that stuff. So my goal with the podcast Audio Lab is to actually show people how to understand sound, how the sound works, how the tools work, so they can figure out their own process. Just taking someone else's process, someone else's microphone, when it comes to sound, it may not work for your voice. It may not work for your space. So it is important. I know that we all just want the quickest path to getting a good result. But unfortunately, 
audio is a lot trickier than you think it should be. For some reason, it's even trickier than video. And video can be pretty tricky. But cameras and the visuals and the mechanics of capturing light is such that it's easier for computers to help you more than it is with audio. Maybe we'll get there someday <laughs> with, you know, you just push a button and crank out and it sounds pristine no matter what space you're in, no matter what microphone you're using. And there's a lot of people spending a lot of time working on that right now. But in my 30 years of experience, I have yet to find an easy automated tool that makes it perfect every single time for every situation, every different voice. If we all sounded the same, if we all had the same environment to work in, there's just so many little factors that come into play, including with the human voice. There's just so many little details. And so with the Podcast Audio Lab, I'm trying to help inform people and to be aware of these things in a way that is not overly technical. It's still technical, like I can't get around it, but I'm trying to explain it in a way that it's accessible to anybody at any level. And I know for me, even as somebody who's been doing it for 30 years, I'm still learning stuff. So even for the more advanced podcasters, there's stuff for them at the Podcast Audio Lab. And I think that's one of the things that you find in podcasting is you get deeper into it. Like I said, the foam worked for me, and then you start to hear the problems with the foam. Mm -hmm. A certain mic works for me, then you start to hear the problems with a certain mic. And I think all podcasters go through that. And I think that's the way to do it, really, because in the end, it really is about your content, your delivery that's the foundation of everything. And then you can put this stuff on top of it and you've got everything. I mean, don't think that a beginning guitar player needs a Fender Stratocaster. It doesn't matter to you yet. Right. And just like that, a beginning podcaster, you don't necessarily need to build panels. You don't need to necessarily have a broadcast quality mic. But what you can do using what Marcus is talking about is use the rules of audio to say, well, I can take the USB mic that I've got because that's the best mic that you've got, the one that you have in your hand and the one that you're going to use. And I can take that into the closet and I can arrange some books in a certain way, or arrange my clothing in a certain way or stand where I'm facing the corner and I sound so much better than I did. And then you just build on that. Yeah, absolutely. The website, meonlylouder.com. And the way Marcus got that name is he's so good at mixing <laughs> One of the artists that he was mixing told him, he says, it sounds like me, only louder. <laughs> That's what we're really looking for, right? We want you to come through that microphone and this processing, but reach more people. And you got to get loud to do that. That's right. And we want it to sound like us on top of all that. We want our voice <laughs> to shine through. If, you, if, it's not, if, you, if you're hearing a bunch of noise and reverb, that's, that doesn't sound like me. Yeah. <laughs> well, look. We have it happen. I know you have those guests. I certainly do that. They're talking into the wrong end of the mic. Yeah. They are on the other side of the room and, you know, and, and <laughs> it's no, no. It, uh, I mean, sometimes it, it, it's funny to read these great books and then I'll hear the audio book. Yeah. And I'll say, dude, you just killed it. You would have been better off <laughs> hiring a professional voiceover or even somebody like me. Yeah. <laughs> I could have done a better job reading your stuff than you. And it shouldn't happen like that. But these basic tools and these concepts that you're teaching at Me Only Louder, that's it, man. I mean, that is so much more important than people realize. People say, oh, it's the content. People stay for the content. Yeah, they do. But think about if it's just a little bit better. If we use a sports analogy, Michael Jordan, great player, right? But was he 100 times better than the last guy on the team? No. Did he get paid? hundred times more than the last guy on the team? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the concept that we're talking about. You don't have to be that much better. Just a little bit. A little bit adds up. And with audio being the only way you're getting your content into people's brains, it better be the best quality possible. And it's easy. You're recording it anyway. So go to Me Only Louder. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, if you haven't already, what the hell, man? Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. One click is all it takes Got an iPhone button, Android button, RSS button. You're a podcaster. You should know what that is. Bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Marcus has some great stuff too. You've got a book marketing podcast. If you're not doing books in addition to your podcast, check it out. It's called Book Marketing Simplified. And that one's great. And he sounds great. If you want to hear what Marcus sounds like when you put a guy like him with that kind of talent to the mix, Book Marketing Simplified. Marcus, thanks for being here. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. 
especially and 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 actually I watched the behind the scenes footage from shoot what is the name of the movie sorry um it's the new Disney animated one with the the dragon um I'm way over my head here. 